Welcome to the New Ventures podcast. My name is Sanjoy Sanyal, and I am the founder of Regain Paradise, a boutique clean tech consulting firm, and also a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Judge Business School. My guest for today is Travin Singh, the founder and CEO of Crust Group, a food upcycling company. Welcome, Travin. Yeah, hi, Sanjoy, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, Travin, it's uh, when we are recording this podcast, it's 9 a.m. in uh, UK. And I'm actually drinking my flat white, but I'm imagining, as I always do, that it's 5 p.m. somewhere on Friday and I'm drinking an upcycled beer. What's an upcycled beer? Yeah, I mean, we actually have made a coffee beer upcycling stale coffee grounds. So that could potentially be your morning beer. Um, So upcycling basically means um, we look at something that is food loss around us. Due to a system issue, it is being um, unused and unsold and right now being discarded away. And then we actually upcycle those into a higher value product. Uh, So in my case, beer and also non-alcohol beverage. That's great. I mean, using coffee beans. Tell us a little bit about the process. What type of ingredients do you use and where do you get it from? We do upcycle um, different surplus. Uh, we started off with bread, but slowly but surely we moved to a wider range like rice. We've actually done pumpkin, quinoa, pineapple, lemon lime, um, coffee as well. And we actually even did something a bit more interesting recently where we started using locally grown botanicals as a hop substitute. So right now we, we do work with plenty of food service companies, um, supermarkets, bakeries, and even hotels, as long as you do have surplus food, that's where Crust can essentially come in and use those to upcycle into a higher value product. Great. And what is the manufacturing process like? It's not that different from how you actually just manufacture your standard beer range and non-alcohol range. Um, So instead of me buying more grains, for example, for my beer production, I now maybe replace anywhere between 30 to 50% of my total grains with a bread or rice, right? Extracting the sugars content out of the surplus food and uh, converting um, those into alcohol. Um, Whereas for my non-alcohol beverage, um, we actually work with uh, different fruits and vegetables. So instead of us buying brand new fruits and vegetables, right? Why not upcycle something that's that's going to be wasted already? And it's not just surplus food. um, It's even like ugly fruits as well um, that are not being maximized. So we come in and we maximize those. That's great. And uh, the beer that, is produced from this process. Does it taste like normal beer? It, and is it priced like normal beer? And then what does the final product look like? It definitely tastes like normal beer. Um, you know, we have been focusing a lot more on like the whole R&D process to make sure that it resonates with long, normal beer and still for wider for the wider market that is accessible to everybody as well. Because if you try to make something totally different, a lot of education needs to be done um, and a lot of marketing needs to be done. So the plan here was, Uh, to just produce essentially the same product, but in a much better manner. In terms of pricing, um, yes, we we started off um, much higher than most beverage companies out there, mainly because we had more moving parts, right? Um, And when you do anything at at small batches, naturally the the cost will be much higher. But we have grown quite a bit, at least in the last two, two and a half years. And with scale comes a reduction in cost uh, because you do streamline your operations as well and you maximize those. So we have been able to minimize our, our total cost um, by around 20, 25%. And we have also minimized our cost to consumers by the same amount, just to make it more accessible. That is great. I mean, reducing the costs and making it easy for customers to transition. Uh, my next question, actually, you've kind of already alluded to, that is your R&D process. What is the sort of R&D that you had to do to make the product taste like normal beer? I would say it's just about formula, like doing up different recipes and formulation and then doing test batches and you know, doing trial and errors and tasting them, you know, getting a, a, a wider audience to, to taste the product as well, uh, comparing it with what the current market already has and just standard R&D stuff um, and taste tests that, that we've actually done so far. Um, I mean, I think within the company, we have probably already done many, many different variations of um, uh, beer using surplus food. So we more or less know how to maximize um, and what's, what the end product will be. So yeah, pretty much just like any other food technology company out there. Great. Let me dig a little deeper on this. So you know, what is the kind of starting point? Is it like the way you're describing it as recipes? On the other hand, is there some basic RNG that needs to be done? 
or is there some starting technology that you are trying to adopt? It's a basic R&D, at least for the beer side of things. So what we are doing, right, with at least our initial product is not to complicate things. Uh, it's not to, to, to focus on deeper tech. Because when, again, as mentioned before, when you focus on deep tech, there needs to be a lot of education that, that needs to be done, right, um, just so that consumers can understand it. So every single product that we're going to release from now until like maybe one year from now, right, will be, um, is just to show you that you can make essentially the same product, right? But with better methods, for example. Maybe I'll elaborate a little bit more on other stuff that we've done where you know we need to dive a little bit deeper into R&D. So for example, there's this plant that goes into beer that, that's called hops, right? Hops is what gives the bitterness and the aroma to the beer. Unfortunately, in Singapore, we have a very tropical climate and we don't grow hops here. Um, it's mostly grown in the US, UK, you know, New Zealand, Australia, and, 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 and a lot of other places. So everything is imported in. But a lot of our food waste actually comes from trade. You lose around 10 to 15% of yield the moment you import something into a market. So in most indirect way that we could also reduce our carbon emission and reuse our food waste is to be a lot less dependent on trade. And what we actually did in Singapore was we you know, worked with different bot- gardens here, right? identified a few botanicals that might mimic a hop um, or the properties of a hop, and we started using them instead. So for those sort of, I would say, R&D, then you need, you need to dive a little bit deeper, right? You need to understand the properties of the plant, how best to maximize it, right? So it's not just as easy as putting it into the wort of the beer. Um, you know, you need to understand pressure, you need to understand temperature um, and a lot of different properties before you can actually really, really get a, a good product out at the end of the day. This is very interesting. I mean, what you did was to use locally grown plants, that's what you call botanicals, I suppose, and uh, to mimic the properties of imported hops. But to do that, you have to both understand the plant qualities, but also the manufacturing process. Have I understood this correctly? Yep, absolutely correctly. Fantastic. You know, getting back to what you actually did, you did a lot of recipes and you got customer feedback. Just tell us, how did you do that? Did you have focus group customers? What was the process like? It wasn't so difficult in a Singaporean sense because, um, I mean, I am Singaporean as well, so I do understand the, the palette of Singaporeans. Uh, but yes, we do have focus groups. We do a lot of tasting sessions. Before we even do like a bigger, bigger batch of um, a new recipe, we will do much smaller batches and just either hand it out to, uh, for free to different people just to get feedback or organize different tasting sessions or outlet, let's say, for a current product that I already have. I will also give like the new samples Again, just to get feedback. Another thing that we've also done is um, we have started doing like workshops, for example. We have also done uh, even input like QR codes on our on our sample batch, right? Um, so that when we send it out to customers or potential customers um, to try them, right? Um, and they can scan the QR code and and, and, and input their, their their feedback as well. Um, so just various ways. Wonderful. How long did it take from the time you started uh, sort of making these recipes? to the point when you felt that you really had a product that you can take to a nice little bar in, in Singapore? At the moment, our turnover is, is pretty fast, actually. So like the moment we do have a recipe, um, we know it's going to work. You know, so we know that there will definitely be a market for it. But when I first started, I guess the very first couple of batches I did, right, with bread, um, I got my friends all, over to my, to my place and we did the batch together. And it turned out super bad. You know, thankfully, <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, like, thankfully, we, we, we learned from our mistakes. Um, and so this was, I think, back in, like, late 2018. And then in early 2019, I actually traveled to the, uh, to the States um, in California, uh, visited, like, Santa Rosa, San Fran, San Diego, uh, because I do, like, American-style beers. Worked anywhere between one to three days in, like, 11 different breweries uh, just to understand different concepts, uh, different branding, you know, different styles. Um, and before I came back to Singapore in uh, Q, uh, I think late Q1, 2019. And then finally did a couple of batches, um, uh, this time without my friends. But the, the batches turned out pretty good. I uh, you know, got people to try them um, I, and they liked it. And then before you know it, I just dived into the market. I really like the way you described going to the United States, and, you know, in the California area and spending time almost as an intern, right, in, in these microbreweries, you know, learning how they do the process. That's so real, you know, making, immersing yourself in process. But we've talked a lot about beer, however interesting it is. Uh, You know, you also make non-alcoholic beverages. Tell us a little bit about that product. Yeah, 
um, it's not a juice, it's not a kombucha. So what we are trying our best to do is focus on like the soda market because we felt like there's plenty of alternative in the meat space right now, but there is a lack of alternative in the in in the beverage space. The production and the manufacturing of beverage hasn't changed much in like in like the last thirty to forty years, and there's only an alternative for milk. Um, you know, so we thought that we can come in and tackle the alternative side of like beer or alcohol, and also the soda side of things. So. When we make a uh, crop, crop is our non-alcohol product range. We do focus on making it very commercial, very millennium-like. It's a soda drink. It tastes good. You can drink it by itself. But if you want to, I guess, add it as a mixer into like your gin, you could also do so. And yeah, so so we do have like some local flavors as well. Like in Singapore, we did one, um, like our very first crop was a product called pineapple tart. So it's literally like your Chinese New Year pineapple tart. We're mimicking it in a beverage sense. Um, and yeah, so super interesting so far. We call it naturally essence sparkling water. And it's also functional. So that was um, an, an idea that, that we had. We wanted it to kill tubers in one crop. Um, where it's an upcycled beverage, but it's also functional. So we do add parabiotics inside. Um, so it does have um, some, some benefits as well. Oh, that's really cool, actually, if you ask me. But, you know, in these cases, you know, what's the type of food waste that you upcycle and where do you get that from? Is it the same types of partners that you had for the beer or is it different? Majority of them have max, like different types of surplus food. Uh, majority of the partners that we work with, but... Um, for crop, we predominantly upcycle fruits and vegetables, where, whereas for crust is um, bread and rice. And the fruits and vegetables do come from like all those locations I've already mentioned before. But aside from that, we also do work with a lot of, I guess, juice companies, for example. So yeah, because a lot of these companies know how to maximize the fruit or the flesh of the fruit, but they don't maximize like the skin, the, the, the peel, um, the core, the rind. Um, you know, even even the seed as well, right? So these are all stuff that are being thrown away, but they have so much of properties and also flavor as well. So that's where we come in. Great. Was the process of getting uh, customer acceptance, the recipes that you talked about earlier, was it any different in these non-alcoholic uh, beverages? We are still quite early stages in crop. Uh, we have soft launched it um, last month um, and we're going to do a proper launch later this month. You know, so we are still undecided. I mean, we have done plenty of taste tests, um, getting different feedback as well over the last one year of us developing um, the uh, three recipes that we actually have. We do have our yearly event called Crust Day that's happening on the 23rd of April in Singapore at a location called the Refectory. You know, so Crust Day is, is going to be the time where we will officially launch crop. And it could also be uh, another space for us to, to come in and gather as much feedback. But right now, we want to keep crop small. We want to focus on just having it online um, or through our web store for at least the first three months um, up until we can improve on the product further and also improve on our logistics and operations in the background before we start uh, focusing on supermarkets and, and different retail sector. Um, so yeah, so it's yet to be decided. And at the same time, you're going to Japan and other countries as well. To what extent do you have to repeat this whole process every time you enter a new country? We have a very hyper-local model. So when we enter Japan, it is not that we are a Singapore company or Singapore startup setting up shop in Japan. Cross Japan is for the Japanese market, for the Japanese people to upcycle surplus food in the Japan market while making consumer-driven products for the Japanese palate. And that's our model. That's our, our vision of scale, right? Because a lot of food waste and CO2 emission comes from trade. And as much as possible, what we do at Crust is not just a branding play. It's not just an R&D play. It's a lot to do with supply chain play. A lot of the focus has in the last six to nine months has been on supply chain because I could have easily gone to, a, I guess, a, a place in Cambodia, for example, and right? mass produce my products, right? Um, and then just mass export worldwide. And I would have done so much better at, at the early stage. But the focus here is innovation, right? And innovation so that we can actually scale proper and scale while reducing our carbon emissions. So yes, we have to repeat a lot of the processes. And yes, when we enter Japan, for example, we need to then understand Japanese consumers, right? Their palate, um, you know, what kind of surplus food they actually have because Japan is a lot more interesting than Singapore, right? Singapore is so small, but in Japan, there's 47 different prefectures, right? And different prefectures have different culture, different produce, right? So for example, Ehime Prefecture is like the largest producers of Mikan Orange, right? So 
these are the kind of prefectures that we can also come and work with and we can create um, certain products for them, which maybe, maybe perhaps in the future ties even um, nicely with our tourism as well. Right. I really like this. The way I'm understanding this is that you're not going to mass produce something, bring it in bottles in a country and, and sell it through the large distribution chains. You're going to go to a country, uh, you're going to understand its local food wastage patterns, uh, you can understand its customer demand, and then you're going to develop a product that is uniquely aligned to each country. Is that kind of what uh, the philosophy of your international expansion? Um, yes, that is the game plan. Um, you know, so each market and each crust will have its own identity, you know, run by a team of locals. And that will be the way that we want to move forward. Uh, we might do some distribution to other markets, but it will be uh, to neighboring countries only. And there will be a certain, I would say, certain point where we will never distribute beyond that. But in Japan, I mean, I just have to ask you this question. Is there something unique about the Japanese culture uh, that made you feel that this is the first country that we must expand to? I mean, Japan has plenty, right? Um, it is the third largest economy as well, and for very good reasons. Um, the interesting part about Japan and our expansion into Japan, um, I've been asked plenty of times, like, why Japan? Because um, plenty do feel that uh, it is, it's a very traditional market, right? Um, but when we were looking at a new market to enter, right, we had two options. Either we move to the west side of the world, right, where a, a brand like mine is not foreign, right? There are plenty of sustainable options out there just maybe with very different solutions than mine right um but if i do enter there yes my go-to market and my market entry will be much faster right um but i will only be sharing a part of the market share whereas option b was um enter a market as traditional as japan right now um and know that the first one year is going to be very difficult but it's all about relationship building and once you build a relationship right life will get much simpler and relationship in Japan actually stays for a very long time. And aside from that, the government in Japan at the point of time, um, when we bef just before we entered, were also looking at various policies where they can come and contribute to reduce food waste in Japan, right? Um, um, and then we thought, okay, maybe Japan might be a, the perfect market for us because we can then come in and pioneer a movement and at the same time also work very closely with the government officials there, um, which we have actually more or less achieved both so far. Great. One thing that I'm curious to understand is, are there regulatory issues involved? Because at the end of the day, you're taking food waste, uh, which could have, for example, bacteria, and then you're making them edible products. Is there any regulatory and food quality and standard issues involved? Um, so in Singapore, we do work with uh, Singapore Food Agency and also NEA very closely. So there's a difference between food waste and food loss. Uh, we use mostly food loss. So the difference is food waste is what you and I as consumers, you know, we consume our food uh, or meal halfway and we throw them. So that's the food waste. Food loss is due to a system issue, right? Through production, uh, through supermarkets, for example. And these are all unsold and unused product. That is, that some are within its shelf life, right? Some, if you store it in a chiller or freezer, right, will still remain fresh um, um, over time. Uh, but again, due to a system issue, um, they are being discarded right now. So these are the ones that we actually come in and we consume uh, or rather we upcycle. So even the bread that we actually upcycle, right, we have, we have a maximum accumulation period of seven days because we are sticking within Singapore's um, food agency's regulations on bread in a cold, dry temperature it can actually last up to seven days. So at the moment, we don't have any regulatory issues, but every single time we do have a new recipe and formulation or a new method of doing things, we do always engage with um, NEA, SFA and just get second opinion on, on what's doable and what's not. And it's the, same, uh, the same is also being done in Japan. So we do stick within all regulations. Right. Our audience who may not know what NEA in Singapore is, which could you just introduce the, the, this organization, please? Yeah, it's the National Environment Agency. Which is essentially responsible for all standards and testing. Yeah, they focus on the environment, whereas SFA, Singapore Food Agency, focuses on the food side of things. Correct. You know, we've talked a lot about your products. Apart from selling your own product, and I found this very interesting, you have the sustainable unique label where you work with other companies, just upcycle their own food waste. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, there was a business model we actually came up uh, with, I think probably almost two years ago, but because of COVID, we couldn't introduce it in the market. So the sustainable unique label is a model named by us. Uh, We're going to trademark that as well. And it's where we differentiate ourselves from every other beer, beverage, FMCG company out there in the market. So all these companies are all competing based on branding right um and how different their branding is compared to others whereas for us it's all about coming with solutions and the SEO model is where we come in and we work with all those partners that i've mentioned before uh but then these are also partners who have their own sales channels and essentially we come in as their r d partner we you know i guess take a look at their top three or top five surplus food accumulated of um, every week and then we do a new recipe and new formulation and we co-produce and co-brand a product with them yeah, so essentially we come in and we build different products for different FMB companies. And then for us, it's a B2B transaction. That means I then come in from an R&D standpoint, we build a product, you know, do, do have a new recipe, co-brand it, and then we sell it to them or from a wholesale level. And then they then sell to their own consumers. So in terms from a sales channel wise, it's much faster, much more efficient for us to actually function. But environmentally, um, you know, because we're working with such large companies right now and the batch size are also much larger, um, our impact also increases over time. So the pain point that you are solving for them is that you are reducing their costs, you are increasing their revenues, and you're also giving them environmental uh, talking points. Yeah, so that's absolutely true, right? A lot of bigger companies right now, they need to have a sustainability report at the end of their financial year. Having an initiative where they work with Crust, right, allows them to not just look uh, at their surplus food and find an alternative for it, right, but they now have their own branded product. So from a marketing standpoint, it also is, um, there's a lot of benefit because if we don't come in and upcycle these, right, um, these will eventually end up in the bin, which means that um, these companies have to also incur more logistics costs. So what is the progress you have made? How many customers have you signed up? You know, there are quite a few numbers. It's not a, it's, it's not a concept, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's got real revenues behind it. Correct. I, I would say like ever since vaccination rates started going up and FMB started opening up um, across Singapore and also in Japan, right? The bigger companies that we spoke to before, they, they did come back to us and ask us about the SUL model. But a lot of the contracts we have owned, we have signed came in probably only around four to six months ago. Or a lot of the larger ones, I mean. So we just closed like Dairy Farm in Singapore, um, so Cold Storage Marketplace and Jason's. We upcycled their bread um, to make a beer for them called Bond Bread. And the same company right now, Dairy Farm, we're also talking about crop because they have a lot of fruit waste. So they want their own crop. We also closed a deal with Red Mart Lazada, upcycling their bread. Um, so we will be launching that in May. We did one with Tiong Baru Bakery um, so far, and we have, we have also done one with uh, Better Barista Coffee Company, Salad Stop in Singapore as well. In Japan, we have done a collaboration uh, with Ritz Carlton Osaka, with uh, Aman Tokyo, um, with a curry chain called Zipangu Curry, where we upcycle their curry, with a couple of companies like Maison Kaiser, Livernest, Cafe Company, so those are a few of the companies that we are we have uh, spoken we have already done um, collaborations with so far, and we are also talking to Singapore Tourism Board. Um, we are talking to Resort Centro, some Gardens by the Bay, and Marina Bay Sands also. You know that's remarkable progress post pandemic, which leads me to ask you, you know, towards the end of this podcast, I have often heard you say that partnerships are key to solving the food waste problem, or as you want to probably nuance it a little further in this podcast, the food loss problem. Why do you think partnerships are so important? This might just be my personal opinion, right? But I, f- I feel like a lot of the problems that we face right now, uh, both environmentally and socially, is because of competition, right? Or the mindset and mentality where we got to compete and cut each other out just to succeed, right? But I don't think the future of food is competitive. It should be more collaborative. The Ed Cross Group. We have a very lofty ambition of um, re- reducing 1% of uh, global food waste uh, or food loss by 2030, right? And us as a company, right, we cannot do this by ourselves. And that's the idea behind the SUL model, right? Where, where we come in and we upcycle all these surplus food and we build different products for other companies, right? Collectively, right, we can achieve that 1% reduction by 2030. I mean, I really want our audience to understand. Your company has that lofty goal, reducing food loss by 1% in this decade. And yet you feel that it is not something that you can do on your own. You need to collaborate. So just imagine if somebody had to reduce 100%, you know, how important it is 
to discard the notion of competition and embrace the notion of collaboration. I think, you know, Travin, you've really, really said something very important. I do hope our audience takes that away. But just to get into a little bit of the mundane things, one a partnership that I really wanted to understand more about is the partnership you have with Sasgain. We actually do work closely with uh, Sasgain. You know, so it is a platform where Crust is on board. But then we also do use them for a lot of the different events that we that we host. So, for example, Cross Day, and you know, we use Sasgain to actually engage um, different individuals and even companies who are in the space. Um, you know, they also do have um, a very interesting model right now, where when you use Sasgain, there's an initiative where every single product that's being sold um, at Crust, a small amount goes into donating for you know planting a tree elsewhere. So these are just different different um, initiatives that we can do with Sasgain. It is also a very good platform for people to understand sustainability and um, I know a lot of the environmental and social causes that, that we have. And what I like about SARS Gain the, the most is the fact that they are bringing a lot of individuals and brands together, right? To work towards a common goal. Um, um, and But they don't just focus on food waste, right? They also look at waste management. They look at a lot of different uh, plastic waste as well. So it's much wider in terms of what I'm doing, whereas I'm a lot deeper when it comes to the food tech side of things. And just to help everybody understand, Sasgain is a platform that is helping Singaporeans adopt sustainability practice. So for them, you know, partnering with an organization like yours helps them sort of bring new offering to the Singaporeans. Is that kind of what I should take away? Um, yes, they do. Yeah. Okay, great. So one final question. What are your thoughts on the Singapore ecosystem for building a food tech company like yours? There are uh, some very interesting companies coming out of Singapore. Yeah, I mean, Singapore is a very small place, right? And we import easily most of um, um, what, what we consume here. But it is actually, it's, it's a great place to have a holding company. You do have a lot of government support as well. It is turning into a food technology hub where a lot of um, startups are popping up, right? And and that's where, you know, I feel like the collaboration uh, model comes in as well. It's not just with me working with a lot of other hotels, supermarkets and, and all, but it's even me working with other startups and seeing how my solution can work well with theirs, right? And how we can collaborate to make sure that we work towards a common goal. Singapore is on the right track, but in all honesty, I think we are still... We're getting there, but we're still not as close as the west side of the world, um, you know, where initiative like that is already done everywhere. Um, you know, it's something that is started maybe or, or rather many years ago. 30 by 30 goal, it's a good goal to have. And they are really trying their best to build an ecosystem for startups to come and flourish um, in Singapore. And for you being based in Singapore, how hard has it been to uh, get, for example, investors? I would say a lot of the food tech or the sustainability investment right now goes into like alternative protein, right? Because a lot of people understand that more right now. There's not a lot of investment being done in like the upcycling space, I would say. Um, not a lot of bigger investment being done in the upcycling space. Um, but that is increasing to a certain extent. But Singapore is still a very good platform to actually raise money because a lot of investors are also here. A lot of family offices are also here and a lot of them have holding companies here. But at the end of the day, Crust Group as a company, even though we, we are based in Singapore, we still had to enter a much larger market like Japan just to show progress, just for the fact that Singapore is just way too small. My final question will be, as a Singaporean, and Singapore is a small market, but it's also a foodie's paradise, right? So which is your favorite hawker center? <laughs> um, whoa. That's a hard question, right? Probably the hardest. Yeah, I, I, I like food, <laughs> but um, I'm not sure which hawker center is my favorite. I usually visit different ones for different food. I can't even pick which is my favorite Singapore dish. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I like the one at Gilang Baru. I also like the one at Amoy. I also like the one at Maxwell. I like the one at Amokyo. Oh, yeah. Okay. I actually do have one. I just thought of it. Um, all at Port Road. Okay, great. Wonderful. Is there any last message that you would like to leave for our audience today? So a lot of the collaboration methods, right, um, or collaboration model that we think about, right, requires us to think wider, right, and understand different pain points as well, right, because only when you collect enough dots, you can connect in enough dots. I would like to maybe just say one last thing before I leave. Um, so someone once told me before where, like, the smaller your reality, the more convinced you are that, that you know everything, 
So the only way for you to understand more and like do more, right, is to widen your reality. Great. Wonderful. With that, thank you very much, Kraven, and wish you all the best. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for having me.